So the topic we're talking about today is uh, about digital economy. In fact, digital economy becomes so important that starting 2015, the G20 have adopted as a policy, as economic policy, that uh, saying that digital economy will help to grow, the, uh, to achieve global economic growth. But after that adoption in 2015 in Turkey, which we were very much instrumental because we were part of the task forces that have helped to adopt the digital economy by Turkey. In fact, before 2015 in Australia, digital economy was not even at the radar of the Australia G20 policy recommendation, economic policy recommendation. So after Turkey, uh, China continue the process and also continue fur further adoption of the uh, digital economy. The same thing for Germany and now also Argentina and so on. So in every G20 now, there is a new task force is called Digital Economy Task Force. Bear in mind that we st I started this initiative about digital economy more than 15 years ago. And we have signed agreement with uh, almost 75% of the world population represented by the pan-regional organizations such as League of Arab States, African Union, Organization of Islamic Countries, Organization of American States. So we signed with them an agreement to deploy digital economy in, the, in their regions. But the irony is that after the adoption of the digital economy, now they make meetings and they to define what digital economy is and how it, it can help the world to grow the economic growth of the world. So a lot of large corporations, a lot of, of big consultants, consultant firms that they came together and they start to define what digital economy on behalf of those countries and G20s and so forth. And, so on. and obviously each one of them is presenting digital economy from his perspective to sell the product they have, i.e. artificial intelligence, robotics of things, internet of things. But our voice, what we presented to the G20 said, this is not proper way to do it. Because if you wanna define digital economy, we have to go on the ground level and we need to ask the people on the ground that what kind of tools you need, digital tools you need, so you can do a better job. And based on that, after the adoption of digital economy at the G20 level to sustain global economic growth, we launched in 2015 a, what we call G20 Nation case study. And we went to the G20 Nation, all over or the 19 countries around the world, and we established partnership between us in every country and with the public and the private sector in these countries and the academic sector in these countries to we build what we call team in every country to make this assessment. What assessment? To hear the voice of the citizen on the ground say what kind of tools you need to do a better job. What digital tools you need to do a better job. And we have done that. And it was involved about 90 ministries, NGO and IGO and G20 nations. We made this assessment and the result was staggering. We recognize that in the B2B environment, which is the mother of all industry, just to give you an idea, the B2B is uh, today is about 140 trillion. It's bigger than the GDP. Why? Because example, when Magna, it's an automotive industry, they make engines in Canada, they make the engine for Ford, and when they sell them to Ford, the value of this engine go in Canadian GDP. But when the engine goes to Ford and they put the engine in the car and they sell the car, the value of the engine have, will be resold again. So the B2B value is much bigger than the GDP of the world. So the mother of all industry is the B2B, which is about 140 trillion today. We went to this industry, the B2B, and we, see, we saw how many clusters are involved, and how many entities are involved. So we saw there's the shipper, the buyer, uh, the seller, the buyer, the banks, the insurance, the government, uh, logistic service provider. So we went there and we made the assessment. This is where we made the assessment. We told them since the largest, because if you want to do an assessment on the ground level, you have to start with the mother of all industry, which is a B2B. And then uh, there, there were 19 clusters. So we went to those 19 clusters face-to-face -face interview, asking them again about the tool that they desire uh, to, do, to, to, to do a better job on the ground level. 
And the result that 90% of the B2B participant have no system. So they deal with each other, they do business with each other, but they do not have a system. And 94% have agreed to the common message of what the tool should be, which is what we proposed as how supposed digital economy platform should look like. So 94% have agreed to what we have proposed. And when we say we ha they have agreed, that's with supervision of this 90 ministries and GO, IGO that they were with us making the assessment on the ground level. Now, now that you have defined, so on a policy level, that the G20 now have said, this is a, we need a digital economy to sustain our global economic growth. On the ground level, we went to make the, to hear the voice of the citizen on the ground, what kind of tools they want. Now that we have their voices and they told us what they need, the next step, which is the only logic step, is to bring the industry, the technology industry together, all of them together, to deliver the tools to the end user, so to implement the policy presented by the G20 nations. So why I said the industry, technology industry, I did not say a one technology company, because if you bring a one entity to provide the tools to the, to the world, uh, to the world uh, citizen to, imp to use these tools to, to achieve, like I say, sustained economic growth by utilizing digital economy, this technology company can monopolize the solution. And monopolizing solution is not allowed, especially in such an uh, initiative, which is called national security solution. Because why? Because once you depend on it, so your food put on the table, clothes you wear, uh, material you bring to build your cities, all build, will be moved on that platform. So it cannot be monopolized by one entity. And also there is a data privacy issue. So one company have all this data, it's not allowed. So that's why it requires the structure of an organization that involves public-private partnership. Then the industry comes in, the technology industry comes together, you select the top, uh, under equal opportunity process, you select the top technology firm to come in to deliver the tools to the end user free of cost, free of cost, so they can utilize these tools and we can achieve, uh, uh, deliver digital economy that uh, the policymaker has, has proposed. So this is what we are doing now. So the question is, how are we going to bring those together, which we already have done that. We present the proper value propositions technology industry, the large technology firms of the world, which they have about 3 million uh, engineers, computer engineers, and they generate somewhere about half trillion a year gross. And we present to them a value proposition, what does that mean to come all of them together under one roof, under United Nations flag? And why this is important under United Nations flag? Because once the solution is adopted, you should continue, everybody should continue, have continuous access to it. So as example, if I go to France and I say to France, well, use this system to improve your efficiency, your trade, uh, better trade finance, uh, and so forth, so on. But this system is example, let's say, in the United States. And then for some reason or another, there is a problem between policy, a problem between United States and France. So now in France, they cannot use, maybe they can get boycott and they cannot use this uh, technology. So if you knew that if French people know that this could happen, they will never use the system. So it is imperative, part of the solution, that it must be, it must provide continuous access to this solution, to this technology once it's deployed worldwide. This is why it must be multiple industry come together. So not one, we said why, to offset geopolitical and monopolistic and data privacy concern. They should be all of them together under one building, under the United Nations flag, which is no man land zone. So everybody can have access to this technology. And then this is what we're doing. We sign an agreement with um, Telangana states in India. And uh, we have now also United Nations is a GCEL member. And we have signed agreement, preliminary agreement with the top 26 technology company of the world to come together under this one roof to provide these platforms, these apps to the people on the ground so they can, free of cost, so they can use it and to implement the digital economy. Now, the question is what it is exactly and how this works. 
One of the events that they, in Turkey they did once, uh, uh, they, they did one event in uh, G20, B20 to define digital economy. And I was sitting on, uh, on a panel with uh, one of the largest uh, CEO in the technology world. And in fact, they generate about 30 billion a year and they have about 300,000 employees, that the CEO. And when the question came to him and they asked him, what is digital economy for you? So his answer was that is how, because we deal with CEO of the world, so how you can take technology today and how you can use the technology to provide efficiency to the CEO of the world to do better job. That's his answer. So when the, the question came to me, what is digital economy for you? I says, look, the priority here is not digitalization for its sake, but the priority is how we can have better economy. And if this is the case, we have to understand what's going on in the world of the economy so we can see, we can, we can up to that plan, how we can improve it. So we need to look to the world from a macro perspective, and we see that the world is divided in three categories. I said, high income country, mid income country, and low income country. The high income country, income country have aging population, low birth rate. They generate a lot of goods, but they don't have enough demand to, to buy those, to, to consume these goods. So what is the solution for them? Now at the same time, in the mid and low income country, aging is low, birth rate is high. They want to buy, they want to buy, but they don't have a buying power. So there is a market, but they don't have a buying power. So what is the solution? This is a solution I said, to open the border further in high income country to, my, uh, to bring more immigrants. Obviously this is representing major challenges in many high income countries. The solution is to clone people, doesn't work obviously. So the best solution is to build the buying power. So the 15% of the world population, which is a high income country, have to build the buying power of the 85% of the world so they can afford to buy the product that they produce. This is the only solution. So how we can build the buying power of the mid and low income country, which represent 85% of the world population? There's two ways, process of elimination. Either you give them money and this is not sustainable, or you have to do business with them. So the high income country have to do business with mid and low income country. And why now they don't do enough? No, they don't. Why? Because it's a risk. It's a high risk to do business between high income country and mid and low income country. So the technology, the, so what we need to do, we need to, off, we need to de-risk doing business and we can do risk, how we can achieve de-risking doing business between high, mid and low income country, we can do that by transparency, provide transparency and efficiency. So the formula is as such, I said. So digital economy have to achieve transparency and efficiency so we can de-risk doing business between high and mid and low income country. And by doing that, every 1%, I said, we increase in the buying power of the mid and low income country, we increase the world GDP by $400 billion. So that's, that's the formula. So, the, so this is what digital economy is supposed to do for us, to rebalance, and this is what we call rebalancing world economy. So this is uh, the, the message that we bring to the world. And this is not a simple message. Because this is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very sensitive and power situation. Why is that? Because high income country used to be 22% 25 years ago. Now they are 15%. And by 2030 projected to be 11%. So they're gonna go be less and less and less. So the probability, because they are the powerhouse there. So the probability of what? Of um, wars, probability of high disease is gonna be more and more. So solution must be found now, founded now. We must now work on the solution to, to achieve sustainable economic growth that benefit everybody. So the key is win-win value proposition, it's possible.